Well, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching from home. Uh, we're so excited uh, for this event. Uh, this morning, if you were able to catch us live, we cut the ribbon here at Vision Corner, and now the first official uh, competition amongst students is about to occur here. So uh, we have the Workforce Wednesday Pitch Competition, student pitch competition that our MCs will kind of preface for our, our guests. But again, thank you so much for those who stood around, those that are viewing at home, and I think you're not going to be um, upset if you tune in here for the next hour to watch these kids uh, compete for $20,000. With that being said, I'd like to introduce our principal, Mr. Jason Limbus, and I'll he'll follow up with Mr. Jones, and they will kind of event. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome. Uh, very exciting moment here, a very exciting day, obviously, here at Vision Corner. Um, a little bit about what's going to happen here. So we have um, some groups of students who have been working really hard this, this year. We, we came up with a concept called Workforce Wednesday, and really what it is, more than anything, is a way for our students to become more engaged, uh, more hands-on, uh, real-world challenges that need dealt with, um, projects that we can put out in front of them that – you know they're able to <clears throat> they're able to find solutions for and you know one thing that we that we definitely uh, heard loud and clear coming out of the COVID pandemic was you know kids don't want to go back to a bell to bell schedule they don't want to sit in the classroom for 45 minutes until the bell rings and move to the next class they want to do meaningful you know hands-on work-based work-based learning so we've got seven projects here um seven i'm sorry seven groups uh representing seven different projects in workforce wednesday um you're gonna hear and see a lot of different things i'm not gonna i'm not gonna spoil it you'll 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 organically hear what they've come up with but just great ideas um, that, that kids have had and if you're at lunch and you heard the panel the student panel when teachers allow students the freedom to take the ball and run with it uh, it's amazing what what they can do and it, you know, just in the short amount of time that we've had Workforce Wednesday in our building, um, it's 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 just been, it's it's beyond anything that I could have ever expected. Um, and that's teachers, and that's students, and that's that's everybody, um, because it, it's it, <laughs> there's a lot to do, and and we've got a long way still to go. But it's it's been very impressive. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, I'm looking forward to to hearing what these students have to say, and I hope you are too. So without further ado, Mr. Jones, our community outreach coordinator, uh, is gonna I think say a few words, and we'll get going. All right, once again, welcome. Thank you to everybody who has made this possible today. I've been in this business over 15 years now, the business of education, and this is the coolest thing that I have ever seen. There is a lot of buzz back there. I have had the privilege of watching these students grow and develop all kinds of crucial, just absolute important skills, whether they're going into college, whether they're going into the workforce, whether they're enlisting in the military, I can't say enough positive, just incredible things about our students. Um, any opportunity I get to brag about our students and give them a chance to show off their skills. Uh, I was just telling Mr. Black about this the other day. It is a 10 out of 10 day for me, and I am confident that you are going to be impressed here today. I have in front of you placed some packets there. So as you learn more about Workforce Wednesday, if you already partner with us, if you would like to partner with us, I won't go into great detail, but there's a lot for you there to take with you. Uh, we would love to hear from you, uh, and we'll make those connections happen. I mentioned just a second ago these students and the skills that they are developing and that you'll see here in just a moment. Work ethic, communication, and collaboration. And it's so funny, Mr. Black just caught me a second ago and sat out in the halls where, you know, there's people kind of scrambling around and we're putting everything together here. Uh, have you ever seen this kind of collaboration? So uh, I, again, just cannot wait to uh, get these students out here and let them do their thing. Uh, before we do that, though, I would like to take a moment for everyone here, our judges, if you would, uh, introduce yourself and maybe say a little bit about your business and organization. Dr. Lash, you want to start? I'm Vice President for K-14 and Strategic Initiatives for uh, Ivy Tech's Community College statewide. So support the 92,000 students in the state that are taking dual credit or dual enrollment programs. Um, and um, proud Randolph County resident. 
Hi, uh, good afternoon. Pat Haney, Executive Director of East Central Educational Service Center. Um, We've been uh, uh, thankful to have uh, Randolph Eastern uh, as one of our, our member districts and uh, just incredibly proud of the work that uh, they have done and our very, very small role in supporting that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victoria Herring. I'm a senior project manager with the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. I work with attraction projects and attracting businesses to the state of Indiana. Workforce is certainly a huge part of that. Uh, I also live in East Central Indiana, so excited to be here today. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trevor Friedeberg. I'm the president and CEO of the East Central Indiana Regional Partnership. So we are a regional economic development group that covers nine counties that comprise East Central Indiana. Happy to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jason Troutwine. I serve as the vice president at Reed Health, and I also serve on the Vision Corner Board. And from a Reed Health perspective, we're part of the career pathway for healthcare careers, and uh, so we're excited to be part of this. Uh, Paul Fattis, uh, I'm a local businessman and uh, just a proponent of the county. Cheryl Fisher, I own Matchett & Ward Insurance. Um, it's a business that's been here, it will be 100 years old in 2026. And um, I'm now I'm going to embarrass my son, Mr. Jones. <laughs> but he is a prime example of what this is all about because he you know, did his education and then came back to this community. And that's what we all look forward to. Thank you for having me. I'm Jennifer Housel. I am the HR and IT Director for uh, Cobalt Civil in Winchester. I am actually a transplant to Randolph County, so um, it's my new home and I'm just so proud to see everyone come together. It really makes a new meaning of community. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, but this is the moment that I have been waiting for for not days, weeks, but months now. So without further delay, this is our very first Workforce Wednesday pitch competition, and we are going to kick things off with our first group, Playground Paradise. Thank you. I'm sure many of you in the room have kids, siblings, grandkids, or a younger family member that you have taken to the park. Have you ever taken them to a park that you thought was unsafe? Well, that's what happened with me and my little six-year-old sister when we took her to Harder Park in Union City. There was a slide that was broken off to look like a shank. My dad went home and grabbed foam and duct tape to fix it for other children, but we no longer felt safe to be at the park. If this happened to us, think about how many people have been affected by a same or similar scenario at Harder Park. This is a problem that needs to be solved. That's why we initiated the Workforce Wednesday Playground Paradise Group, a collaborative effort between students in the city to completely revitalize Harder Park. My name is Audrey Black, and I'm a senior member of this group. Today, I'm going to explain why this project is necessary and outline our goals to create a solution. I'm Kaylee Mangin. I'm a senior member of this group as well. Um, I joined this group just to put a positive impact on our city. Um, today, I will be here just to help answer questions if needed. Our overarching goal is to create an inclusive, safe, and ADA accessible park in Union City. This project is not only a want in Union City, but it is necessary. The park is currently not safe. The equipment is not durable or up to date. It is hazardous. It is 70 years old. And on top of that, all of that, it is built under a tree canopy that fosters the growth of mold and bacteria. Our park is also not ADA accessible. The current infrastructure lacks ADA accessibility with grassy surfaces and broken pathways that hinders the mobility for individuals with disabilities. Our primary focus for this phase of the project is to introduce state-of-the-art equipment, including interconnected play structures designed for inclusivity and safety. This mock-up that we have up on the screen is quoted at $500,000. This mock-up is not exactly what we are looking at, however, because it is not ADA accessible. It just gives us a good idea and estimate of what we are looking for. Our primary aspiration is a large connected piece that you see on the far left, but ultimately what we get will be based off of what we are able to raise. Our second implementation is location. We are going to move the park to where the equipment is in the area behind the pool. This way, it is out of the tree canopy that is fostering the growth of mold and bacteria. We will also look to add sun shields to prevent the equipment from getting too hot. These sun shields will let sun sun through to kill bacteria, but will protect children from getting burnt on hot equipment. Our third implementation is sidewalks. These sidewalks will connect the park to the pool and directly to the pool parking lot. We have decided to turn these sidewalks into sensory pathways, where there will be instructions such as hop on one foot or spin your wheelchair three times. These will help spur movement and foster health in children. Our last implementation for this phase is the rubber surface that we are going to add. 
we, the rubber surface will make it so that all the equipment is easily accessible. The rubber surface will also be fall safe from six to eight feet to protect children from fall injury. This is just a start. This year, our Playground Paradise group is focused specifically on replacing hazardous equipment, but that is not the full vision. In the future, Playground Paradise groups will work for a complete revitalization of Harder Park. We dream of adding a splash pad, a carousel, redoing the basketball courts or the soccer fields. With your help and support, our opportunities are limitless. With $20,000, there's a lot that we can do to get our project off of the planning stage and into the building stage. There are many pieces of equipment that we are looking to use this $20,000 specifically for, such as a small piece of equipment for two to five year olds, many ADA accessible or sensory pieces, or it can go towards one quarter of our large interconnected piece. But more importantly, we can put your $20,000 into our Patronosity matching grant, turning your $20,000 into $40,000, which will help greatly expedite our project. When you give to Playground Paradise, you are not only giving for the greater good of the city, but you are giving to many students who have worked hard to learn and apply new hands-on skills. We have a marketing group that creates social media posts, signage, and flyers in order to get our word out to the public. We have a fundraising group that writes scripts, expresses gratitude to sponsors, invents new fundraisers, and tracks data. We have a grant writing group that's become very proficient in writing grants and has worked hard to be able to push out a new one each week. And we have our presentation group that has worked hard to make this presentation and push this out to the public. If you want to know how you can help, come see us afterwards. Picture Tinley and Piper here playing at a brand new park. Imagine the joy on their faces as they explore the revitalized playground paradise free from hazards and barriers to inclusivity. Thank you for your time and partnership. Will you lead the laughter by be and be a playmaker for Playground Paradise? If you got any questions, judges, now is the time. Yes, thank you. If that, yes, if you have questions, now is the time. Great, yeah, great, great job, girls. Um, what, can tell me, I'm, I was curious so if you could share a little bit more about the matching grant and how you can uh, grow these funds if, if awarded. So our grant writing group has applied to Patronosity. It's a matching grant, and basically they're going to match dollar for dollar whatever we put in. So if we're awarded $20,000, that would be turned into $40,000. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah. Um, what is the overall cost for your phase one um, goal? $500,000. Does that include the sun shields and the sidewalks, or is that yep. separate? That includes everything. So, question. Yeah, great, great job. Um, so, from a fundraising perspective, a lot of times, and well, really any time that you're applying for grants um, or you're raising funds, you need to have a fiscal agent. So, someone who's going to manage the money, an organization that you're applying be on behalf. So what group is doing that for you? So that would be the city. We're working in collaboration with the city, more specifically with Steve Shoemaker, and he has helped us with a lot of that project. They're helping us with applying grants and just getting us in contact with people too. They're who everything's going through. Great. Have you checked with other um, or local businesses or anything to provide sponsorship maybe and a naming right or anything like that or so yeah we have a presentation group that has like seven to ten people on it and we go out and we present to local businesses pretty frequently to just try and get the word out and also to look for partnership I don't know. Yeah, that's. can you tell me more about your org organization chart um, you mentioned the subcommittees and you are senior leaders but um, who who runs uh, point of contact for your organization? Um, so our teacher in the room is Sarah Black, and then she puts us all in leadership positions. So there's a leader in each group who Sarah tells what the group needs to do for that day, and then they are in charge of their group for the day. So and would you picture yourself as um, a committee at this time, or do you look forward to like being a standalone business or even a 501c3? I think we're a committee at this point in time. I mean, it would be cool to be a 501c3, but our city already has their own park board, so it's kind of just a collaboration, and we are just kind of taking it into our own hands because, you know, we're the future, so we'd like to be able to come back and bring our kids back here one day. So if you got this completed, it would be turned over to the city for uh, 
to be made sure it's managed into the future as you guys uh, go off to college or whatever? No, so Workforce Wednesday is a continuing project. So Playground Paradise will happen next year and for many years to come. So the goal is to raise up our juniors, freshmen, sophomores, and teach them how to do it. And they will be in charge for years to come. And they will be in charge of the upkeep. Are there any plans for what you would do with the old park? Um, it's, it's just going to be pulled out of the ground. We have some people who are looking at doing in-kind labor in order to pull out the old park for us. So how much of the, the funding of the phase one has been raised at this point? Um, we have over $7,500. Last time I checked, it was $7,500. And then we have in-kind donations from multiple different sponsors who are looking at helping us dig up, d dig up the old park and then potentially helping us with like foundation work. Do we have any other questions for this group? Right, excellent work, ladies. Thank you.
black Hyundai, Hyundai Sonata in here? Okay, judges, are we ready? Awesome. Second group today, outdoor classroom. The floor is yours. Hi, my name is Stacy Jones. I'm Addison Foreman. What? I'm Brian Mosby. I'm Quincy Middle. I'm Kaden Nago. And we're presenting over our outdoor classroom. So a little bit about our project is we would like to create um, a learning environment that promotes collaboration and communication through student mental health and well-being um, while being in the outdoors. Any student on campus can also access this. We have an estimated cost of $40,000. Uh, we broke our project down into three steps. Um, we, uh, you might be wondering why we're doing this. Um, we want a creative learning space that improves student mental health that's environmentally friendly and visually appealing. So nobody wants to be stuck in a room in a room all day just staring at it, right? Like four walls all day. Uh, students' lack of outdoor learning experience, lack, lack of outdoor, lack of outdoor behavior, I'm sorry, lack of outdoor, being, not being outdoors all day is suggested to lead to uh, behavioral problems such as social misbehavior, lack of decreased, uh, decreased attention span, and other things. Uh, research has shown that outdoor learning have huge benefits on students' mental health and academic performance. Students are often calmer and better able to focus when learning in nature. Based on my experience from my previous school, me and my friends would always go outside and do our projects, homeworks, and activities because it is just more fun and enjoyable to work outside. Uh, the, the fresh air and the nice sun made it more calming and relaxing and it allowed us to focus more, to focus more and collaborate more with our ideas. So we broke our, broke our project down into three steps. Uh, solar learning stations, landscape design, and mud pit redesign. So you guys are probably wondering what seating arrangements look like. So we're going to have uh, solar workstations, and um, they're going to be ADA accessible, and uh, that they're just sustainable, renewable energy, eco-friendly. Uh, it has the ability to char charge multiple devices, like you need your laptop, uh, your phone, your tablet, and uh, there's no additional cost to the school. And um, we have an uh, IRA, 30% uh, reduced, so it's like a grant for us. So during our project, we ran into some, to, into some technical problems. Trees in awkward spots, lack of energy, po electrical power, dull and boring space, and it's always wet. Our technical solutions, <laughs> Replanting trees, solar-powered learning stations, pop of color for the landscape, and a deck where the mud pit is. So for our landscape and mud pit redesign, there we have a um, mock-up, kind of what we are hoping to do with the space. Um, you guys can probably come up and look at it later, but that is um, our idea of what we're going to do. So the wider open area that we have currently is occupied by some trees, and that is where we're going to um, place our tables. The trees, for any tree that we take down, we are going to re replant two more trees, so we are not going to be taking away from that, from the environment. And any plants that we use, they are going to be low maintenance um, perennials. Do not add that extra task onto any maintenance crews. We just want to really brighten up the place because it currently is just kind of just grass and walls, and we really want to brighten it up. And the mud pit is an area, the, um, on the design, it's the area with the decking and the couches. That is where it gets very muddy when it rains. It's very wet. It's currently just mulch. And our hope for that is that we are going to place um, decking material there that will also be um, ADA accessible. That could be more of a zen mental health area for students to go to. But it will also be provided with whiteboards so teachers could um, possibly also teach classes there. That will not fit as many students as the tables, and it may not have charging stations, but that is just another area. 
So the estimated cost uh, would be around $35,018.09 or $35,518.09. So uh, who's ready to put their money towards our dream? <laughs> And then we would like to say a special thank you to Jerry Wasson, Dave Wasson, Wasson's Nursery, Frank Miller Lumber, Montana Lumber, and Kent Thornburg. And we are open to donations as well. Is there any questions? Judges, as you think about questions you would like to ask, I know that this group has a model that they would like to share with you, so th that would be a good time if you'd like to hand that to them so maybe they could pass that around and get a closer look. Here's the three guys. Um, one quick question. So I saw the uh, you had the IRA in there for the 40 or 30%, so that's the Inflation Reduction Act, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a question, if, if that doesn't come through, because that program's fairly complicated for anyone who's taking a look at it, um, if that doesn't come through, is it just the costs are just increased at that point, or do you have like a plan B for additional funding or trying to draw those costs down, keep it in that 35000 range? So the company that we're uh, purchasing, uh, purchasing the solar panel stations off of, they gave us uh, quite a few reduced price for it too. So um, I... They brought it down a lot, uh, which helped us out. And uh, that price is without the 30% reduction, so it could get lower. Okay, no, that's great. Thanks. Do you have any concerns of uh, increased uh, needs for teachers because this is outdoor space? And then unfortunately, in the society we live in, sometimes inventory control of students, if in case of an emergency, um, you know, yeah, some sort of an attack or whatever, do you have plans in place for those types of things? So um, where our outdoor classroom is planned to be it is right outside of door S2, so in towards the Spanish hallway. And there is also like another exit towards like the outside of the building because it's like an open space and then there's another door you can exit. <coughs> but you can also come inside to one of the classrooms if there was an, any attacks. And then as far as is there a need for additional teachers because this is outside? No. Um, okay. Have you thought through ways that you could utilize this space when the weather is not perfect in Indiana? <laughs> <laughs> so we have thought about like in the decking area possibly like covering it so that it could be covered there. The um, solar panels might be like covered for like slight weather, but if there were really bad weather, you probably wouldn't be able to use it. But it would a lot of the time hopefully be good enough. And it will be all outdoor material, so it should withstand the weather very easily to um, make it so that you can use it as much as possible. It may not always be possible, but we hope it can be most of the time. Can you give a, uh, an example maybe of a change that you made um, in your, your plan or your design based on feedback that you received? So there were some things that we had changed. There were, um, originally we were hoping to like take out all of the trees that we had and then we had realized that that might not be the best um, way to go. And we were at first thinking of doing just one giant large pad as you'd see on the design, they were all kind of separate pads. We had just changed that to hopefully like fill the space more and also maybe help students be a little more independent and it not feel so much as a classroom so that you felt more uh, independent, but it was still in a classroom environment where you could easily, the teacher can easily handle all the students that are there. Would this be a location that, say, teachers would have to check out? So if they decide they want to take their students out on Friday, seventh period, would there be some kind of schedule that they would have to get on, or is this more of a free space where you guys could go out on lunch period? It, it should just be a free space for anyone. So if you win this money today, what would be the timeline before we would see any um, action? So you probably wouldn't see um, any building probably towards, towards the end of this year, and we are hoping to do it next year too. And we have also thought about getting people together over the summer to start the landscaping designs first before, but the solar stations likely wouldn't come until next school year. Have you, I have two questions. Um, one, have you engaged, um, or do you, would you plan to engage with anyone, for example, like a landscape architect, maybe one that the school works with? Have you had any discussions at all with anyone like that? 
So this is all a student, so it's students hands on. So we're gonna try to do most of the part, but if we need to have other people for like the landscaping, like a landscaping company, uh, if we need them to, we will, but we're gonna try to do our best as students. Okay, that's great. And then I have a follow-up question as far as maintenance goes. So, um, you know, thinking about the school's budget, they would have to take care of this. What kind of maintenance, you know, do you guys foresee, and is the school okay taking that on? So the largest amount of maintenance would probably be, um, you might in the winter, like if we do, do go with couches, you might have to take like cushions inside and things and watering plants, but hopefully the, um, if the Workforce Wednesday continues as long as we hope it will, students will be able to carry that mo on most of the maintenance, which is watering and pruning. And the largest thing would probably be the mowing would just be harder for um, them to mow around. That might be the largest amount of maintenance that would need. It's most of it should just be able to keep going without much maintenance needed to it. That's what we're hoping to be able to, to do. And they are supposed to be on paver bricks too, so <coughs> it's easier for them to mow around. Perfect. Is this in an area that are you concerned about vandalism, like the public getting in and being able to do anything to it that, you know, sadly happens sometimes? Um, it should be good. There's security cameras. It's by, it's towards kind of like the back where the teacher's parking is. Uh, it's quite open space, but the building, how, it, how it's like shaped, it should kind of hide it in the back since so it's going to be towards the back. So there should hopefully not be any vandalism. Do we have any other questions from our judges? All right, once again, give them a round of applause. Judges, are we ready? 
Okay, so group number three of the afternoon, farm to table. I'm Carter Sickles. Is this mine? Hello? Yeah, you're good. It's All, right. On. All right, whatever. Hi, I'm Carter Sickles. This is Rodney Sickles, and this is Alejandro Aguilar Mendez, and we are proudly representing the Union City Farm to Table group. Our group has been working hard to get our school a chicken facility located beside our new ag shop. And not only will this um, provide a chance for our students to get real life experience and to use the skills that, that they've learned in their math, their business, agriculture, and, and economics classes, but they can also, but we are also going to be giving back a percentage of the product that we produce in the form of meat and eggs to our community. Do you care to go into more details, Rodney, about the building? I'd be very happy to. Ooh. So, so as you can see here, this is going to be our model. Um, we are not building a standard chicken coop, nor are we building a commercial uh, poultry barn. This is going to be a um, educational facility for our students, as uh, this is one of the most common practices here in Indiana for agriculture, and we want to be able to get our students involved in something that is going to be directly related to their food, and especially to our community here at Union City. If you can see here, 63% uh, of our students uh, are eligible for free and reduced lunches, and more than 23% of Union City lives in poverty, and there is a lack of fresh food available to them. The only thing we have here is dollar stores and save-a-lots, and that is neither the healthiest nor the freshest, and we want to be able to give back to our community with a very quality product that they can enjoy. Alejandro, why are you here? Uh, yo estoy aquí para representar el Hispanic comunidad y ellos que no pueden entender. Rodney, do you understand that? Not a word. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'll be here. That's why I'll be here. Um, because we are trying to build a bilingual agriculture community. Because it seems like in the year of 2024, more than, a, more than 80 of our students, um, my fault. <sighs> It seems that over more than 80 of our students are non English speakers, and as well as 40% of our community, um, it seems that more than 40% of our community are Hispanics. So that's why I'll be here translating everything moving forward. Carter, what is that you're holding there? I'm so glad you asked. I am holding a black Oshlar pen, and she's about a year and a half old, and almost every single day she lays a uh, dark brown egg for, for me and she is one of the four major breeds that we will have in our coop to meet our meat, egg, and exhibition needs. We will be housing black ocelarps, black opera morans, black americanas, and brown leghorns that will lay um, a total of red, blue, chocolate, white, and brown eggs. And clicker. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you can see here, the yellow yolk is from a, a caged animal and is from a commercial industry, and the orange yolk is from a um, is from a uh, cage-free uh, chicken. And ours will be in long runs, and we'll have and we'll have access to the dirt and the grit, the grass that what that that will give them the best life, and and will give us the best nutrition and the and the healthiest and happiest bird. What are you holding, Rodney? So this is my good friend Sarge here. He is an eighth month old bantam barred rock cockerel and uh, what makes him different than that old hen over there that Alejandro is holding is this is about as big as he gets. And the education that we're going to be providing our students is they're going to learn a lot about poultry, the different breeds. We're also going to be working with uh, our local FFA chapter and also 4-H. That way students can get involved in the exhibition side of things and they can learn more about poultry and its products. Carter, how are we going to move forward with this? When, well, when this is finished, it, it will be handed over to our, to our ag and FA group to, to be managed and maintained as our Workforce Wednesday will strive for more change and some more fre fresh food in our community as we have underway currently a greenhouse and a hydroponic system th that could lead to so much more in the, in the coming years. Thank you for your time. Okay, judges, questions for our group. 
How do you plan to implement practices to prevent things like avian influenza? So our birds are not going to be in direct contact with any outside sources. And any birds we do get in, they'll be directly quarantined and we will be watching where they come from, such as hatcheries that are NPIP certified and other exhibitionists that have animals and, and clean tested flocks. And we're also going to have uh, biosecurity in place, so whenever students come in and out, they're going to be washing their feet and hands to prevent birds from catching sick. So I have a question, and I also want to, just real quick, the two of you guys know I'm scared of birds, and you bring in three of those, all right? Um, just saying. Um, so I'm super impressed you're able to hold those while you're talking. Um, but uh, um, I do have a question as far as your project. Um, from a budget perspective and what you're asking for this group to consider, can you kind of walk me through what your needs are financially and then what, how, we, how this group could help? So our estimated budget, ugh, our estimated estimated budget uh, is uh, currently $62,000 and we have raised over 15,000 ourselves and if we get the 20 grand then that will be the then that will just be us that much closer to breaking ground and starting the build because we would like to have it built or almost finished by the start of the next school year and and this will be a huge project for for the summertime Great, and I have one follow-up question real quick too. On the business aspect of things, so it's, it's clear you guys, on the ag, ag side, you guys are, you know, know your stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I, I don't know where you're at on the business aspect of things as far as, you know, making sure that you guys are, you know, continually bringing in funds that support what you need to do. Who's, are you guys the ones doing that? Is there another group that's doing that? How, what's that structure look like on the business model part? So of it? the business model is we we will be selling um, our eggs, fertilized eggs, and then chicks, and then meat, and then adult birds, and we are raising show stock. So if we sold a trio, which is one male and two females, if they are our highest stock of say black copper rands, that trio could go for five hundred dollars. And if we made those, we might have $50 in feed into them. So my question is also along the business model. Um, I think this plugs in so well with, uh, you know, what Cooper Farms is doing around here. Mm -hmm. Have you guys reached out to Coopers to see, um, you know, you're trying to raise money, uh, if they would do any sort of matching, but allow them to collaborate with you. You know, you talk about the cleanliness and trying to uh, reduce the uh, the mortality rate and whatnot of mm -hmm. birds. You know, for them, the R&D aspect of this on a small scale um, could be really beneficial to them, and they could also provide you guys with information. Is that something you guys have thought about, looked out? Um, you know, because from a sustainability aspect, when you have someone like that partnering with you, um, there's a lot of things that could be mu mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. So we've talked with them already and that they have expressed that that they are super excited uh, about the project and they are on board. They have, not that they, they have not donated any funds yet, but they are willing to come in and donate time with our classes and they have already come in uh, a, a few times and talked with us and they have and they've said that what we are doing here re, re, relates heavily to what we, we could do right out of high school. And they said that they have jobs specifically for what, that, for what we are doing, just talking about genetics and then, and then business models and then finding the niche markets. If you plan to sell meat, do you have a local processor that you're working with? <coughs> have you talked to them? Oh, so when we start to sell meat, we are going to line up someone who is certified to do this, yes. Mm -hmm. Have you explored if this does create cost efficiencies for your school lunch program or what barriers you might face with the national school lunch program? Yes, we do know that there are barriers and this is probably going to be pretty difficult to be able to get our product into the school lunches, but we really are going to try and push it. We are going to encourage it mm -hmm. and hopefully that we can get our fresh, our fresh products into the school lunches. Do you know what some of those barriers might be? Uh, some of those barriers include us not being, like our eggs are not graded, and the meat is going to have to come from a certified place. This is more of just a comment. Um, 
from a uh, Reed does a community health needs assessment every three years, and Union City, from a food insecurity and food desert perspective, ranks among the highest in the counties that we serve. So I applaud you guys for doing this. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what we do today, come find me later on. Um, one of our grant cycles might be able to help you as well. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. I'd also like to connect you to someone who we can solve those barriers. <laughs> Do you have a timeline of when you think you will be able to open it to the public and what are your marketing ideas for making sure they know that you're out there and, and available to them? So we will be marketing in all sorts of social medias and by, by word of mouth and we hope to have this done um, and finished by December and we have uh, birds in there and, and be producing but it's not currently open to the public for a, um, what's the word? Uh, tour? No. Like a retail? Yeah, establishment. yeah, it, yeah. Because of the biosecurity, and if we do sell, we're thinking about selling to, um, like, going to uh, local supermarkets, selling possibly here at Vision Corner, uh, out of the back of the school, where our um, our facility is going to be located, and other various places. If you aren't able to plug this food into uh, the school system, or does the school have any uh, culinary classes to where this could be used for those types of things? Mm -hmm. Just curious. Yeah, so the school has a home at kitchen that, that, that they would probably be more than happy to accept. And we have a uh, Warpost Runs a group, Sizzle and Spice. Yep, and they would probably love that too for uh, cooking purposes. Now, if you're not going to have a retail store, um, a brick and mortar of any kind, where do you plan on storing um, the meat once you start selling that and the eggs and everything that you're going to have? Okay, so we won't have a, a physical place for people to go, but on the outside, we do plan on having a small station with it where people can come and pick up eggs and meat. And inside the facility, specifically um, up here in the front where it's secure from, from, the, from the actual birds themselves, we're going to have uh, large uh, fridges and freezers for what we have produced and cleaning stations for our eggs. The last group let us uh, touch something. <laughs> 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 I was waiting for that. I'm with you. Not the little one. No. Yeah. Just trying to help. <laughs> they want interactivity. <laughs> Would anyone like a closer look at this? I'm sorry? Would anyone like a closer look at this? Yeah, I'll come help. <laughs> Do we have any other questions for Farm to Table? So as you take a moment here to tally scores, jot down some notes, mm -hmm. you guys want to... Great. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for the chicken. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, okay, yeah. So we're taking just about a five minute break so you can talk amongst yourself. If you want to stay and stretch your legs, you can do that. We'll start back about 135, 36 here. More pressure, you can just stand in the spotlight. <laughs> you got the clicker. Yeah, you did. Okay. You're asking phenomenal questions, and the kids have phenomenal answers. Okay, judges, are we ready? All right, I present to you Wigwam Coffee. Hello, I'm Keegan Livingston, and I am here with Wigwam Coffee. Before I get started today, I'd just like to see a show of hands of who all drank coffee this morning. So, almost everybody. Please just keep that in mind as I go through this presentation. So here's just a quick overview of what I'm going to be going through. So, 
my idea for Wigwam Coffee first started when I got into the Sizzle and Spice Workforce Wednesday group. It basically just teaches students things about cooking, budgeting, and everything they're going to need later in life when they're trying to prepare me meals for themselves and for their family. But cooking is expensive, and especially expensive when you're cooking for a class of 20. So the first thought that I had to get past that point was to open a coffee shop to help feed funds into the Workforce Wednesday group. So some of the benefits of Wigwam Coffee would be time management. They would learn it in a food service industry, and then that translates very easily over to everyday life with having to be able to guess how long things will take for you to get done. And then it'll also give them a year or two of experience as a barista, which is a very large job that is all over the place. You can find a job in that in almost any town. And then it also will teach finance, finances and business, which will be easy to translate into their personal life. And then for a couple people, it a year it would also be able to teach them how to manage people. So if they, they'd already have experience as a manager, whenever they go get a job somewhere else, it'd help them get farther in life. So there are roughly one million baristas and bartenders in the US right now. They're not the exact same job, but there are a lot of skills that translate from one to the other. So that would allow them, especially once they're in college, it'd allow them to have a job if they need to make money to eat when they're going through to try to get to their actual career. So a few steps that we'd need to take to get open would obtain the startup fund and purchase the needed equipment. And then thanks to Randolph Eastern School Corporation, I already have a location approved for it. So it'll be in the school. And then lay out the, the store to how we want it to make it run smoothly. And then create the menu and hours of operation. Step three would be the promotion. So we have screens up in our TV. We'd put up our opening date on it. We would send it out on social media to try to get as many people to know about it as possible. And then also in step three, we would be training the students. Step four would start with a soft opening, probably just to, to the teachers, and then we'll know what we need to do to make it run smoothly whenever we open to the whole school. So why is it unique? There are very few schools in the state with coffee shops, most of them being places like Carmel, who is huge, with a lot bigger population than us. We would also have it certified as an SB through DECA. And DECA, if you don't know, is just a program that helps students become better leaders and businessmen. So we would be the first school in Indiana to have three SBs. There's only two with two right now, and it's us in Carmel. So it would also allow students to experience native culture. With our mascot being the Indians, they see that mascot every day. They hear about it. But most people don't actually get to see what it's like. So we would be using things like chicory in our coffee, which is the original ingredient that Native Americans used to make their coffee. So our estimated budget, thanks to Randolph Eastern again, the rent and utilities would be covered. Our fixed assets, such as the coffee maker, the coffee grinder, espresso machine, would come out to about 14000 Our current assets to start off with would be things such as coffee, like the actual coffee ground, coffee cups, syrups, would come out to about 5000 and certifications for the managers and teachers, such as ServeSafe, would come out to about 1,000. And with ServeSafe, it would allow those students, that's a big s step up than most people trying to enter into a restaurant job, which is another popular job during colleges. So our mission statement is, we enable students to grow communication skills, budget money, and create a positive work environment, all while creating an efficient work ethic to help them succeed later in life. So please help me allow our students to savor the spirit of the tribe with Wigwam Coffee. Judges, what questions do you have for Keegan? I think I was the only one in the room that didn't raise my hand about drinking coffee. <laughs> so will you have other products like chai tea or something? I've else? <laughs> looked into that and most likely we would. And then also with chicory, there is full drinks that just use that, that don't really taste like coffee. So we'd also could experiment with stuff like that to try to get non-coffee drinkers interested in what we're doing. So the best business classes to own a business, um, have you discussed this with the uh, administration as far as this should be in the curriculum? This should be a business class. 
um, because you have the management, you have the finance, you have um, you know setting this up, finding out what products are no longer relevant uh, and adapting. I mean, to have a business within a school system that allows people to learn business and entrepreneurialism, this should be a class. Have, has there been any discussion on that? So as of right now, we already have two SBs in the school. So Apache, which is on the other side. Correct. And then the TP, which is a snack store open during lunch. So it would eventually run through the same curriculum that those do to where you have to take principles of business, digital marketing, and then you can go into TP Apache or Wigwam Coffee. Okay. So I, I love the fact that you have a mission statement. That's, that's, that's great. Um, but you mentioned that this is our, or I think you maybe used our or we. So who all is we and our? So the people that are involved in it right now are pretty much just me, Justice Cantu, who is the sizzle and spice teacher, and then Becky Keel has worked with me a little bit. She's the business teacher. Okay. How much, of, how much of the funds have you raised? First question. Second question, when it comes to barista training, um, how, who, who will be able to do that? Who has the um, experience with being a barista who would be able to provide that training for the students? So as of right now, I'm still looking into that. There are people who I know work at hometown that, would, that I could talk to and there's, I could go through training if I had to. I could find somewhere to to work and go through training to get the students ready to be there. But as of now, there isn't a set way to get to that point. And then how much how much of the funds do you have raised from? So we actually budget? have not raised any yet. This was my first starting point because the 20,000 will cover pretty much everything I need to do it. And we're already doing it in a room in the school that where the TPR snack store is located. So it'd be alternating between the two. So a lot of the pricing of it is already covered with that. Um, you mentioned uh, approximately $14,000 in fixed assets. Can you rattle off a few what all you've considered in that fixed asset? So the coffee maker, mm -hmm. which we wouldn't need one that that's that fancy for that, an espresso machine with a steamer on it, the coffee grinder, mm -hmm. so to actually ground the coffee up. Those would be the main things for it. Because we already have things like a register in the TP that we could already use. So that, that kind of stuff would already be starting off there. Okay, and then have you considered taking this as a mobile opportunity? Would that um, find that cost That was efficiency? actually, our first thought with it was to have a coffee cart. And then hearing about this pitch competition, like why go that small? <laughs> why not set our limit high and then eventually we could also run a coffee cart especially down to like the elementary school because that's connected. All right. It's all, it's K through 12, so we could bring a coffee cart down there to those teachers. So I have a question. So it's, this would be unique being inside of a, a high school, right? You mentioned like Carmel potentially has one of these. Um, the market might be a little bit different or might be a little bit skewed compared to just the general public as far as like your price point. So have you done any analysis as far as what uh, the needs are or what uh, a high schooler would be willing to pay or a break even analysis to make sure that you're going to be able to have a sustainable operation? Okay, so for the first part of that with the, w the need for a coffee shop, I've talked to a lot of the teachers at the school and pretty much all of them have said that they would use that daily. They're going to other places outside of the school to get their coffee fixes when most of them, their heart is local. They want to support local. So there's nothing more local to them than being in their own school. Katie, a question for you. Does Ivy Tech have anything in culinary that they could help with the barista training? Is there any collaboration that could be done on something like that? I think there, I was thinking of a few different ways that there could be collaboration. Are you, are your, all of the classes that you mentioned on the pathway already dual credit experiences? I believe so. <laughs> so you say you're going to be in the same location as the TP part, and you're also saying that this money is 100% of it going to the Sizzle and Spice Workforce Wednesday? So the profit, yes, okay. because with it being certified through DECA, you're not allowed to make profit that goes for you back to 
the, the people running it. It, ha it can go back to the students, but it can't be making a consistent profit. It has to be getting put back into it. So do, are you going to have a, a way to differentiate the monies coming in to you on the register or whatever compared to what's going into the TP part of the organization? So that you're Yes, so we use Square so you can separate what it's being used for. Because we use the same system for like Apache. We sell Apache apparel in the TP. Okay. Are your aspirations to be a chef or in the culinary? Yes, that is. I, well, I want to go to Johnson and Wales <laughs> in Rhode Island. Wow. <laughs> is there any concern about competition with other local coffee shops? Not really, because most. One thing is competition is healthy for both sides. So it. It would help us, one, the students learn more about how to beat out the competition and how to find your target market that's going to be different than what the other coffee shop will be, which the only other coffee shop in town is Hometown Coffee, which is right across the street. So teachers do go there, but a lot of their people are just people around the community. We would be more geared towards just the teachers and the high school students. Anything else? Let's give him another round of applause. Okay, judges, are we ready? All right, our next group, The Schoolie Project. Before we start, we'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm Jace O'Connor. I'm Luke Collins. And I'm Jason Connor. Recently, I had a unique opportunity to travel to the Carolinas through our school. I got to experience historical Charlotte, aircraft carriers, and a whole new environment in general. I'm thankful for that, but while I was enjoying these historical sites, I thought about how much better it would be if my classmates were with me because they should be granted with the same opportunities as I had. Sometime later, the idea of creating a traveling schoolie was suggested. I realized that this could be the bridge to give other students a chance at similar opportunities. And that's where we came up with the schoolie project. So, what is it? We plan to transform a decommissioned school bus that the school has already agreed to donate to us into an eco-friendly RV. We will travel across the western United States. It is something that the school can keep and utilize for future use and not just a one-time thing. Thank you to RESC, Randolph Eastern School Corporation, who has already agreed to donate the bus. All we need now is $20,000 and we can convert it into a comfortable, mobile living space. We have hand-selected students with the passion and the skills to complete this project. We are aware of some of the problems and challenges we will be facing. See, we understand there are going to be some unforeseen challenges as well, but we are willing to face them head on. This is why we have reached out to local businesses to assist us with any questions and any help that we need. The bus will provide students with hands-on learning experiences and many other skills outside of the classroom. It will feature plumbing, recycling, and solar panels. 
We are aware that the solar panels are going to be a big part of our budget, and that is why we believe it is crucial, or we believe that it's crucial to our project. The AC and the solar panels are going will provide us with a comfortable mobile living space, and this is a great opportunity to work with green energy, and this is all a part of the learning experience. But the learning experience does not stop after the bus has been built. We have planned a 10-day trip over spring break 2025 to the great American West. This trip includes Mount Rushmore, Yellowstone, the Four Corners, and Gateway Arch, just to name a few. All of our stops are in a great, incredible experience while providing great educational opportunities. We have planned this tri trip on a software named Road Trippers. Our expenses are lodging and attractions at $1,500 as well as our fuel. This brings the total cost for the trip to $3,000 and the total cost for the project right around $20,000. What are some pros of our project? Well, this is a completely student coordinated project. We will experience hands-on learning, home renovation skills, and experience in trades. We understand that there are going to be some challenges. On the road, we know that there could be potential breakdowns, which is why we will have an RV AAA membership for assistance if needed. We plan to maximize every square inch with creative storage solutions to take all of our belongings with us. We also recognize all this driving may be difficult for just one adult, which is why we will have two drivers to rotate and keep us safe on the road. We want everyone to be able to use and enjoy this bus, which is why we plan to construct separated quadrants for sleeping on this bus. Ideally, one group will sleep outside in tents, while the other will sleep on the bus. Is this a one-time trip? Absolutely not. Although this main trip is the culmination of our project, it does not end with that. For instance, it can be used for trips like the annual Washington, D.C. trip that our school hosts. It could provide temporary housing for natural disasters or any other needs. We recently had a tornado, and this bus could have served as temporary housing for a scenario like this. Aside from the educational value from the trips, the bus will need hands-on maintenance, which will provide students with a new approach to learning real-life skills. Don't just take our word for it. We surveyed our student body, and 40% of our students have never been to a national park. 50% of our students have been on two or less out-of-the-state vacations in the past four years. 20% have not been on a single one. And this is why we want to take everyone with us on our content creation journey. Through the use of TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube, we plan to document the bus transformation, the ups, the downs, the challenges, and the victories, as well, all as well with our exciting trip out west. We have prepared some information that Luke and Jason will be giving out now. Thank you for this time, and thank you for this opportunity. Does anyone have any other questions? We'll give this group an opportunity to pass out their information Thank you. Thank you. and open it up for questions. Great job. Thank you. We also have our trip mapped out if you guys would like to pass around to see exactly where we will be going. It's front and back, too. Yeah. Okay, questions. How many students can fit on the bus at one time? Bus RV? We are planning on eight right now. Eight plus the two drivers? Yes. Okay. How would those eight students be selected? For our first group of students, they've been carefully selected for the skills that they can bring to the table. They have connections with different businesses and other things to help us accomplish this goal. But in the future, uh, we think that it could be, the students could be picked based on incentives of how they do, how they do in school, or it can just be used for field trips, things of that nature. Um, you say it could be used for field trips, however, it seats eight um, on the bus, so how logistically would you make that work? We anticipate that the school will support this, so we think we can expand on this. Um, possibly have more than one bus, so maybe we took two buses. If our classroom size at our school is pretty small, so we could use two buses if the first one goes well. The adult drivers, are they also chaperones, or is yeah. there going to be an age <coughs> group? I mean, are you having to be 18 to do this, or They will be 17 uh, or actually faculty mem members of the school driving. The bus would stay school-owned where it's insured under the school's insurance policies and liabilities and those things. 
We are currently looking into that. Um, it's, the title will be transferred to an RV title, so we won't have to worry about any of the seatbelt laws, any safety laws like that that fall under the school bus category. But your liability on something like that in insurance would be extremely expensive. That's the reason I'm asking whether it would stay under the school uh, because their policy to cover this from a sustainability aspect would be a lot. And that's the reason I was curious where you were at on that. That's a good question. And we will find an answer to that. Would students and the chaperones be required to cover their own <coughs> meals and um, other expenses on the 10 day trip? And or is that chaperone being employed or are they a guest? The food is something we've talked about and it would all depend on how much budget we had left at the end, but we were talking about supplying for our own food and anything else that needs bought on the trip by ourselves. Does the driver need compensated? <laughs> that is also another good question. <laughs> Have you considered um, like renting out this vehicle just as another like an actual stream of revenue to cover some of these costs? I know yeah. there's apps that are available. So we're looking at this bus as a proof of concept. Um, if this first one goes well, we're open to the idea of expanding and looking at it more of a business aspect. So watch the insurance on that as well. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I love this, I, this idea, uh, work, but working in a couple of different organizations throughout my career, I also know that sometimes great ideas, risk, off, risk officers hate them. Um, and so, uh, so I'm thinking about, you know, co-ed, I'm thinking about um, some of the, you know, making sure that, you know, all those kinds of risks, you know, boys and girls together in the same bus and weather inclement, you know, inclement weather, that kind of thing. And then also to Paul's point about insurance and what that could be from a risk perspective for the school. I know you guys are in the beginning stages. Have you have those conversations come up and what did you think about those? Yes, we have. Uh, we have thought about the boys and girls problem, which is why we would have separate sleeping coordinates mm -hmm. for them. Um, it's if we could be outside the camp, weather permitting, that would be ideal. So mm -hmm. that they'd be separated that way as well. As a parent, if a student comes to me and pitches this idea to me, it might let's say my son and wants to go on this and says it's an educational opportunity, <laughs> mom. <laughs> How pitch it to me as a student going on this? How is it educational? With our survey results, many of our students, based on our area and income, most of our students in our school don't get to go many places. And most, if you're thinking about a regular vacation, most people go to Florida or somewhere like that. And we're going west with all of these different landmarks and places that hold a lot of educational value that you re read about in books, but you never get to see in person. Sure. So, uh, you know, as I say, I think to that point, uh, you know, one opportunity may be you know, the way that you connect it back to environmental studies or maybe the way that you connect it back to history, um, so the places, you know, cultural differences, those kinds of things. That might be an opportunity for you to explore should you move forward with this. So I guess uh, to tie that in, you're stating this would be educational because you're going to these places with landmarks. So would there be tests in this, uh, you know, I mean, to make sure people aren't just using this as a vacation? Uh, how, how do you plan to handle that? That's a good question. We really haven't thought about that part of it yet, but... I'm sure we can look into it. And with it being an educational trip, another thought um, you might want to put some, some time into is it only allows for two adults. Are those two adults going to be history teachers that also have a Class B CDL that can drive the, the bus? We have not thought about that either. We are planning on one of our drivers to be Blake, who's the leader of our group. And you will not need a CDL to drive it with the title being transferred. Okay. Do you guys have experience in um, the maintenance? The Do you know how to do things? We do not, but okay. we yeah. have a bus. Our yeah. bus barn has a lot of experience too, and that's one of the things that we're and willing to learn. we training you guys in, in mm -hmm. this too. That's part of your project. And we also have a new ag shop that was recently built with tons of tools, and there's plenty of people that have experience that can teach us and help us work through it. Put a mechanic on the bus with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's what do we have any other questions? Let's give them another round of applause.
these guys from right. Greenville yeah. are very interested in becoming part of our network of having students yeah. work with them, and they were excited. So I told them I'd pass the information. <laughs> All right, judges, our next group, Outdoor Landscaping. Hi, I'm Riley Jones. I'm Scarlett Van Meter. And I'm Joshua Sordino. And our Workforce Wednesday project is Outdoor Landscaping. While Scarlett passes out the packets, Riley will be talking about some of the problems that we have. People don't care as much as they should, and our Outdoor Landscaping project wants to teach students to be involved in the nature and environment. Maybe. Oh, some things about us. What we started doing was cleaning out the woods. As you can see, the woods is located in the back of the football field, which is on the first page of the packet. And the red uh, squares are what we have cleared out. And the rest of it, we're still working on it. And some of the goals that we have are to help out making a garden to help out the pollinators, starting a garden club, and getting a greenhouse to grow more plants. Goals and objectives. Our first objective is to clear out all of the invasive honeysuckles so we can maintain a very healthy and beautiful garden. Our second objective is to help the pollinators by planting a pollinator garden and our third objective is to get people to join the garden club so that outside workforce wouldn't say they can help with it. What is honeysuckle? Honeysuckle is an invasive um, plant that is quickly ruining our woods. It gets spread uh, around a lot by birds eating the little berries on the leaves and it is becoming a very big problem. Garden Club. If you look at this paper right here, this is a poster we are wanting to put around the school and around town to show people to join the Garden Club. As you can see, it tells us the purpose of it and why you should join. Anybody is welcome. Um, if you look in this picture, you can see how unhealthy and how much honeysuckle we have cleared out. And you can see just how overgrown and pretty much dead it is. So we're trying to make it look better. Values. Our project teaches on education, helps out with mental health, and get students outside of school and away from electronics, which have become a very big problem nowadays. And on the packets, the very last, the very, the second to last page shows the how much we have spent and the donations. And the last packet is what we're trying to look for, like the things that we need to spend the money on. The two most expensive things on that, on those pages, are the greenhouse and the sponsors. We're 
the sponsors is really expensive because that is going to get the, like we're going to get a teacher to help with the garden club and run the garden club each year so we are going to be able to pay for that and pay them to do that. Do you guys have any questions or anything? Let's open it up for questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the business model is going to look like? Um, are you going to sell the flowers to keep the funds moving? Um, what we were talking about was growing them, planting them to help out the pollinators, and then if we have a lot of flowers left over, then yes, we're planning on selling them. So just for clarification, this club does not currently exist. This would be no. asking for a new club to exist. Yeah. So might you offer um, your services to other parts of the community? We could. Is there currently like, um, not a garden club that's at the school, but like a community garden club or something like that that you could help <coughs> work with or get their expertise to come help you? I don't think so. I have no idea. Yeah. Have you surveyed around to see <coughs> if this is a club that people in the community would want to be a part of? Or? No, we have not. But it's we're planning to do it in the future. Is there a lot of kids at the school that are involved in this? Or? Our class is roughly around 15 people. So most of them are interested in joining the club. Can you guys talk a little bit about the, the greenhouse that you selected um, for the Garden Club and, and why you selected um, that particular uh, size or structure? So we wanted um, a big greenhouse so ag students can get involved as well, like growing stuff. So it won't only be used for the Garden Club, but also for our agriculture. And I think it was... 14 by 10 maybe and as far as like um, how would how would the the uh, construction and installation of that um, take we place? have not gotten that far okay as on your projected expenses there you know it's a pretty extensive list can you kind of talk about your process <coughs> to go through and develop this how'd you how'd you come up with this list so it's just there's just stuff that we need like for safety, obviously, the gloves, saw knives, and those are hand saw knives, I think they were. So is this greenhouse fully outfitted? I mean, is there irrigation, or where are you at on that? We don't know yet. Where will it be located? Um, if you look at the first page on the handout, mm -hmm. it's, there's, the yellow. it's the yellow box up top. And it'll be there because um, it'll help from vandali vandalization and it'll keep it like enclosed because there's already kind of a greenhouse there and some of the students help. So a lot of greenhouse activity takes uh, place during the summer months. Is this something, who's going to take care of that uh, when school's out? That's something the, the people in the garden club would have to talk about and help, help out. <coughs> now, if you're not looking to um, sell, how are you going to continue to replace your recurring costs that you're going to have year over year? Because, you know, for example, the gloves, a box of 12, your people are going to lose them. You're going to have to buy those probably multiple times a year. So how do you plan to um, fund on a go forward? Probably just trying to grow more plants to sell them. I, that's something we haven't talked about that much. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Let's give them a round of applause. We have one more group.
All right, judges, we have one final group, Tribute Wall. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nova, and I'm here with my two classmates, Rosie and London. And today we're going to be presenting to you guys our student pitch idea about building a Tribute Wall. Who are we? We are students a part of the Junior Historical Society group. We want to show gratitude and appreciation for those who have graduated from UNC Junior High School and served in the military. Um, our slogan that we want to put on top of the wall is support heroes on our veterans. So our mission is simple. We want to create a veteran honor wall made for Randolph Eastern School Corporation graduates who have served in the military. We believe this is really important to honor these forgotten heroes and help our community appreciate them more. So who is Jonathan L. Stoops? Jonathan L. Stoops is a former UC graduate who was in the Vietnam War of 1968. He unfortunately lost his life during the war and he is now being honored at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in the Washington in Washington DC. There's also a plaque in the gym foyer of Union City Community High School honoring, honoring him. As you can see, he is one of the many people that would be featured on our veteran tribute wall. So what makes our idea unique? Something about that makes our idea unique is not that that not every school has it. They don't have the opportunity to do it like we do right now. So we're trying to go all out for this. This is why we want the money. This is something that's really special to us and we want to make our school better. And we want to make this so that people can look at it and be like, wow, this is a really cool idea. I wish our school had it. Why can't we do this? This is an estimated cost that we got from Hydrojet. If you don't know what Hydrojet is, it's a local business located here in Union City. Um, the estimated count, uh, amount is $16,770,000. We could go higher with the money, but if we have any money left over, we would use this to pay for those who serve so they wouldn't have to pay to get their plaque onto the, um, ca into the cases. Um, this slide is basically just the wall description, like what we're going to have on the wall. Um, the wall would be 7 feet tall and 20 feet long. We want to have the five branches of the military, and we also want like the pla pla plaques under like the branches of the people's names. Um, there's going to be lights that will shine on the name so you know whose name is which. And there is also going to be a display with the American flag in it. So right now I'm going to pass out um, two at each table. This is a little visual example of what we want our wall to look like. Here in a little, um, in a few minutes, we are going to show you an example at Monroe Central that is a school close to us. And um, we'll tell you the estimated amount that they had at their school since we've gotten into contact with their ex-assistant um, principal. So the location in mind for the wall to be placed is in the gym foyer across from the concession stand. Currently there are trophy cases there, but we would have them moved somewhere else throughout the school. We think this is a good place to put the tribute wall because it would gain attention through sporting events and after school activities like plays, musicals, award ceremonies, and banquets. This again is Mineral Central's um, honor tribute wall. I think this is a really good example that our school could go off of. Um, since they are so close to us, we could get the essay in amount. Mr. Tipple, if anyone knows him here, he is an assistant principal here. He used to work at Mineral Central. He said that it cost around $9,000 for them, but that was about four years ago, so the cost could skyrocket now. So we're aiming at about $15,000 right now if we want it to make it the best it, it's going to be. Okay, so that concludes our pitch presentation on building a veteran tribute wall. Thank you guys for listening. Do you guys have any questions for us? Let's go ahead and question. Where are you going to get your list of of the honored veterans? Um, we also we have three separate groups in our um, pitch, like in our classroom. There is a fundraising group that's trying to raise money for us. 
the pitch competition, uh, competition group, which is us, and then we have one another group that is trying to gather names. So, as we said, like Jonathan L. Stoops, he's one of the people we would put up there, like my grandfather, um, Brad Jessup, and others just like that. So, can I ask about that? Is that what inspired you to take this on as a project, is or is military enlistment part of your futures? Um, actually, our teacher kind of came up with this idea himself, but it's also something that we took up onto ourselves to present to you guys because we felt that this is a really big thing that we should be sharing to everyone and because we want to be concluded into this and make it into our school so everyone knows about it. So I love Hydrojet and the service they provide. i um, curious, though, have you considered collaborating with Randolph Central and the E-Wing, the P-Tech over there, um, to see if... Uh, that's something that could be collaborated with and maybe reduce cost. Uh, we haven't yet, but we are also collaborating with the alumni group. So that's another group that we're collaborating with other than Hydrojet. But since you said those other places, we would think of collaborating with them too. Can you, can you share a little bit more? You mentioned earlier about the plaque and about how some may need to pay for a plaque or maybe, maybe they may not. Can you explain that process a little bit more, please? So to get your name up on the board, we originally thought of making you pay between 5 and $10. But since if we won the 20000 we would want to not make you pay for it. So we would use that extra money so you wouldn't have to pay for it. You would get your name up there for free. Instead, you would just contact us, and we would get your name plated up there by itself without you paying money. And then one other question uh, or comment is, you know, you, when you think about, you know, maybe some of your peers who might be, you know, enlisting into the, the military, I, have there, has there been any thought in, in ways you might be able to incorporate this wall to celebrate their enlistment um, when that occurs? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we could probably figure out some way to do that. Uh, I know at your guys' graduation, when you graduate, they tell you if you're enlisting to the Army or wherever you go in the military, so that's another way you could be like called out if you're going to the military, but it is a good idea. We could put in to saying that. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> so what? Hydrojet would make the, the area for you or whoever, but who's going to do all the engraving and are they going to be available every time you want to add a new one? and? Well, I assume it's engraving uh, is how you're going to... Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, when we were trying to get in contact with Menor Central, um, he said that there were a few kids that were incorporated <coughs> into the idea of getting that. Um, there was a kid, I forget his name, but I do have it in an email. Um, so we were trying to get in contact with him, but I don't have any of his socials. I tried looking them up. It's just I haven't gotten it yet. But that's something we could do. He said that there was a guy that worked for them and did it, so we could get in contact with them if we eventually get in contact. Are with they just going to be a little metal plaque with their name and their their yeah, rank? Yeah, under all. their branches, yeah. Because I mean, like web jewelers, they they engrave mm -hmm. plaques and things, and maybe that's something that yeah. they could help do that for you. Mm -hmm. We all considered a succession plan. Um, Y'all are going to graduate soon, <laughs> so who's going to keep this alive when you're gone? Well. We're only freshmen right now, so we have three more years to do this. But eventually we want to create a group that will be continuing through the process when we eventually graduate. And I think it's really important because many kids each year want to go into the military. So I think this is something that more people will want to get into when we make a group into our school. So you mentioned moving or relocating some of the trophies or trophy cases. Um, are there any any costs or approvals that you need to uh, secure or consider as far as that as far as this part of this project? Um, our superintendent has gave us the consent of moving them somewhere else. We haven't really found a spot where we can move those trophies, but we will find a spot for them. Um, he said that we can move them, so. Aaron Black is our superintendent. He said we can move them. Okay. Um. And um, have you had any success with fundraising so far for this project? Uh, no, we have not. Okay. We kind of failed. <laughs> 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 um, can I add something about what you said earlier about the moving the trophies? Mm -hmm. So what we intend to do is 
probably hire someone to move them for us, and then if we get the twenty thousand dollars, use that budget to pay for them to be moved, mm -hmm. and you know. That. <laughs> Do you know like what kind of equipment it would take to engrave the little plaques? Because maybe that's something that if you win the money, you could get that extra piece of equipment for Apache. And that could yeah. be something we could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is something we could put into our school. Maybe kids could do that in a group, find out how to do it. Hey, hey no. Tell them about, they're asking about how you're going to get names. You, you guys are doing that. Tell them about the QR code. Oh yeah, we do have a QR code that um, allows people to scan it and they can go into the, um, the Google form, like doc thing, where they can sign it out and tell us where they graduated from, what branch of military they're in, uh, what their name is, and all of that, <coughs> so we know. Do we have any other questions? I think it's awesome that it's three freshmen presenting. Yeah, yeah. Give them a round of applause. Okay, judges, up front, I said with confidence that you would be impressed today. What do you think? We are going to take approximately 10 minutes to finalize everything. We will have a title card on the screens for home viewers if they would like to submit their votes. So at this time, we will take a brief pause and be back shortly.
Good. Oh. Okay, thanks. Thank you once again, everyone, for coming. Join us here on our very first Workforce Wednesday pitch competition. At this time, we have a special announcement. We have a very generous donor who has pledged $1,000 to those groups who did not make our top three. So if we could, we would like to call the schoolies, outdoor landscaping, outdoor classroom, and tribute wall up to join Mr. Adams and Mr. Black. At this time, we will announce our third, second, and first place finishers individually, one at a time. Coming in third place, Wigwam Coffee. Congratulations, and again, uh, this is this is for you to take with you and give to Miss Keel to hang on her wall. But uh, just and how important this is is there's connections already in mind, um, maybe through Ivy Tech and some other routes of some ways that you can learn and grow your business model as well. So, great job today, King. In second place, Playground Paradise. And ladies, phenomenal job. And I'm just gonna share this quickly. Um, these checks kind of got, there's a lot of deliberation that happened in the back end. Um, from a presentation standpoint, combined with, you know, impact, uh, th this $10,000 we know is automatically $20,000, and we know that you all are working on raising more funds, but I think it's important to call out that your presentation was um, at the top of just about everybody's list, so great job. And of course, coming in first place, Farms to Table. <laughs> Gentlemen, I don't know if it's a live bird scaring one of our judges half to death <laughs> or what, but um, we, we all think that you guys are on to something uh, in particular to a service to this community that can be sustainable. Um, so a uh, job well done. We, we love the knowledge that you two young men bring to the table. So great job on your presentation. Uh, please make this $20,000 impact this community for years to come. So great job.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is tough tough stuff and these students absolutely crushed it here today. I'd also like to give a round of applause for the staff, the faculty at Randolph Eastern. They are clearly doing amazing things, helping bring up these students, coach them, guide them along. So let's give them a round of applause as well. Thank you again, everyone who made this happen, everyone who could join us here today. I do know that uh, our businesses are open until five. If you could uh, possibly swing by and uh, throw some business their way, they would greatly appreciate that. Mr. Black, do you have any final comments? Okay. Again, thank you, everyone. <laughs>